Dear students, dear guests, distinguished guests, uh, dear professors, um, dear uh, Katarina Matanova, it's a huge pleasure and privilege to welcome you tonight um, for two inaugural reasons. First of all, this is the first Monday of the spring semester at Vesalius College, and I'm quite impressed that so many students are here because normally on a first Monday in the evening, uh, people and students are overwhelmed or they uh, spread out to the city um, to explore other things. It shows already how, uh, what kind of pulling factor um, Dr. Matanova has. The second purpose of the inaugural lecture is, or what are inaugural lectures here, um, the Zalias College has a full-time faculty of, let's say, theory-minded professors that um, you see day in, day out. But the Zalias College also has a second set of professors very much integrated in the college, and these are adjunct professors of practice. So, but make no mistake, uh, the adjunct professors of practice we have are very, very well versed also in the conceptual, theoretical aspects of their subjects. But the most important thing they bring to the college, to the faculty, to you as students, is of course their vast experience and their vast insights into major issues that not only relate to their own field of work, but also touch on major and important issues of contemporary global affairs. So the faculty is always very, very careful, very choosy, very picky in appointing um, adjunct professors. Uh, and it's a huge, huge pleasure that we uh, well, got our professor of choice uh, with Katarina Matanova in order to uh, uh, unleash her knowledge to you as students, particularly in this semester's course um, that is co-convened together with um, Professor Svetlana Kopsa, who has been a long-standing professor here, head of international affairs department before. Very happy to see her back now. Um, she's also kind of jumped the other way around. She did the opposite uh, as our inaugural professor today. She was in academia for a long time and now joined the policy world at the European Endowment for Democracy. But when she left, luckily, she said, I will not fully leave. I will still want to be engaged. And it's also thanks to you that you brought um, our distinguished professor to, to the college. And then we have Dr. Vesablod um, Samokvalov, who uh, also joined as an adjunct professor, previously educated at the University of Cambridge and a, a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow. Together they will teach international approaches to state building, reform and good governance in this semester. And I, when I saw the course description, the course uh, title, I was very, very excited. I would probably sneak in every now and then just to get an eye and get some kind of snippet of knowledge that will be delivered. The course couldn't be more timely um, if we think about the variety of challenges that are, uh, we are currently faced, not only in Europe, but in the world at large. If we think about the need for reforms, for democratic reforms, and if you want, many ways, a stalling agenda on all of these um, issues. The course is not only focusing on, on the broad concept of state building, um, but of course also on the issue of good governance. And again, you know, this is not only a key priority for European states, but if we think at the Western world at large, if we think at certain long-standing, what we assume long-standing truths about good governance in the West, in the US, in Europe, in Europe's periphery, a lot of work remains to be done. So that course stands at the center, if you want, this semester uh, on a variety of issues and the curriculum. It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce a little bit more um, our new adjunct professor um, of practice. Um, Karina Matanova is currently Deputy Director General of DG NIR, the Director General for Neighborhood Enlargement <coughs> and Negotiations. Um, and it, of course, I hope I'm not uh, uh, saying or embarrassing her by saying that that is the title, but behind that title is a lot of impact, influence, and I would say notoriety within the Commission. She is known for her outspokenness, she's known for her incisive intellect, and for not being afraid to put a point across if it needs to be put across. She's also known for having a balanced view that not only follows, let's say, the most obvious and powerful members in the EU, but that also takes a weighted uh, approach and assessment that takes into consideration other European countries' views as well. It, but in her analysis and advice, she is always at, let's say, the EU level and doesn't take uh, nationalist positions uh, or any kind of efforts to uh, influence her. She has previously uh, worked uh, in charge of cohesion policy coordination at the European Commission, um, but she also brings vast knowledge from the World Bank. 
so again, having the kind of global view, uh, having a multi-issue view helped her a lot, or it helps and keeps on helping her in her current work. Uh, but it's not only at the international and global and European level that she has left her mark and continues to leave her mark. She's also worked for her own uh, country and national government, the government of Slovakia, uh, from 1998 to 2002, where she was chief institutional and policy advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister for Economic Affairs um, and also a key architect of the Slovak economic transformation. So reform and transformation is something that seems to be in her blood. She brings also an interdisciplinary background um, to this college, trained as a lawyer, uh, and she also practiced um, for leading law firms in New York and Washington. She was a Slovak Woman of the Year in 2000 and received a Pro Bono Human Rights Award uh, in 1993 from the International Human Rights Law Group. And that's one of the things we take dear to heart. We hope not only to have inspirational professors amongst ourselves in terms of knowledge, but also what we sometimes call maybe a little bit loftily, but nevertheless sincerely, a moral compass. A moral compass uh, that not only will allow you to make <laughs> tough decisions uh, with competing interests, but also that keeps issues such as human rights um, at heart without getting cynical uh, or overly idealistic um, about it. Well, uh, I don't want to keep you any longer because I know uh, uh, she's probably <coughs> in her head already buzzing with, with many ideas um, and, and, and her lecture. I, I just want to again <laughs> extend um, huge congratulations and thanks from the entire faculty of the Zardis College upon your appointment as an adjunct uh, professor of practice in the International Affairs Department. Uh, and the floor is now for you. Would please uh, join me in a warm welcome to Professor Matanova. I will not uh, diminish the number of students that signed up for our course, uh, and that I'll be able to uh, meet some of the expectations that, that you raised. But indeed, thank you very much for the, for the invite. And as I already mentioned to the students in the intro hour to our course, that uh, I am so excited to, to do that. I've been actually uh, thinking about and, and talking to friends and colleagues about wanting to teach and wanting to share some of the experiences for a number of years. But it was not until I, I had coffee with Svetlana that, that it gelled together and, and uh, and then we were joined by Sevalot and went through the course that the real excitement uh, kicked in because I, I think that uh, we all will be visiting each other's uh, parts and we were actually quite excited that we'll be able to sort of co-create uh, co a course which indeed is uh, quite uh, topical. And uh, so I, I'm going to speak sort of around five themes. First, just the setting then a little bit uh, my story and how it relates to the course. Um, then I'll sort of comment on the new realities that we are, we are faced with. Then what the EU has to offer in this part of the world. And then I'll conclude. Feel free to interrupt. Feel free to ask questions. I mean, if we're gonna get sidetracked too much, then I may uh, return to some of the issues uh, in the end, but uh, I think we have quite some generous allocation of time, and that's good. That I, you know, usually when I speak, I have like you have 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Now I don't have that. I was told so. Uh, if if I'm getting sidetracked, then you know, bring me. B feel free to bring me back. Um, and I'm going to try to make it exciting also for the youngest member of this uh, room, which is uh, my little Max, who <laughs> came to look at his mom. I, I'm, I promised not to embarrass him, and I just uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't keep that promise. So. <laughs> but um, I flashed a little bit of a map. I, I have some, some uh, copies here as a handout. We couldn't find uh, a three printer in color, so I think ah, th there it's uh, better seen. Um, the, the the course that we are going to be teaching, and also my my lecture tonight, has uh, a bit of a geographic focus, and uh, it's a geographic focus that is very Eurocentric. Most of our students in the course are Americans, so Eurocentric is not not. Uh, 
the view that the students would connect uh, with it, but uh, they're used to having Americanocentric maps and everything else. So the concept is, uh, is, is, is clear. Uh, but when we talk about neighborhood, south and east, and when we talk about enlargement countries, these are reflections of two policies that uh, the EU has vis-a-vis -vis its immediate neighbors. So this is the European Union, obviously, and when we talk about enlargement uh, countries, that's this big blue blob, which is Turkey, and this smaller one consisting of six countries of the Western Balkans. So five countries of the former Yugoslavia, Serbia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Macedonia, and Albania, and Turkey. So that's the enlargement space. And then this lighter green one is Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, three countries of the Southern Caucasus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Middle East, Mashrek uh, countries here, uh, starting with Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, and Maghreb from uh, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, and, uh, and Egypt, well Egypt is not correct, but the 10 countries of what we call Southern Neighborhood, which the course doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, deal with specifically, but it's here just to, just to show you what the policies cover. So we will be talking and analyzing and using case studies throughout the course from the uh, enlargement experience and from the from the Eastern uh, neighborhood experience, the Eastern uh, countries. We were introducing each other and, and uh, to the students and the students to us uh, this evening and I kept my introduction for the, for the course because uh, the Dean was kind enough to put some highlights uh, uh, in, but what I would like to sort of share with you a little bit my story because it relates very concretely to the, to the subject of the course. I grew up in a communist country. I grew up in Czechoslovakia, which later on split into, into two parts and uh, studied both in Czechoslovakia and in the United States at the University of Michigan, uh, studied, uh, studied law. And then I started working in the US. I worked for uh, law firms, then I joined the World Bank and worked very much on issues of governance, rule of law, and judicial uh, reform. In this part of the world that we are discussing, whether it was Croatia or Serbia or Poland or, or uh, Russia or Ukraine. Um, and then the enlargement happened uh, uh, of the, to the 2004 of the European Union. But before that, I actually took a leave of absence from the World Bank to go back and work with the government in Slovakia. And this is prehistory for, for you, but we had this uh, you know, prime minister who turned out to be a, a scoundrel and uh, got uh, the pres son of a president kidnapped, etc. His name was Vladimir Mečiar. And uh, in 1998, there was an upswell of, uh, of uh, uh, very much civil society led uh, upswell of, of uh, protest against him, and a new government came in that sort of civilizationally uh, put the country on the right path and on the path of EU integration, NATO integration, and so I went to work with, uh, with the government. And then after returning to the bank, was there for, for two more years, the actual EU enlargement of 2007, the 2004 big bank enlargement of 10 countries happened, and I applied and joined the European Commission very much with the, with the idea that I want to contribute to bringing the East and West together and uh, be the uh, representative of not only my country, but, but uh, you know, the Easterners that uh, people in the Commission didn't quite know how to, how to, you know, how, how to put the contours on the white elephants that, uh, that suddenly uh, appear there. So that was one of my very, very uh, strong motivating factors. 
And then I went back to the World Bank, and now I'm back in the European Commission in, in DG neighborhood and enlargement, and very much dealing with similar themes from uh, inside the EU, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis the Balkans or whether it's vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Eastern uh, Partnership uh, countries. And this has been my, my sort of excitement and motivation for the course, that there is so much that happens in reality, both from a perspective of a country that's trying to accede to the EU and, and perceiving the big monster of this uh, multinational uh, uh, bureaucracy uh, from the from the exceeding trying to get into the club perspective as well as seeing the mechanism and the mechanics from inside uh, how, we, how we perceive and how we put our own uh, prejudices and views and perceptions onto countries uh, around the EU there is so much to to share that I was very very excited about about this and uh, since Seva and Svitlana will marry that with the conceptual framework and the basis, it can actually be quite, uh, quite exciting. So I'm very much uh, shaped uh, by, by the struggle for democracy and the struggle for integration into the European and uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, structures that it really sort of conditioned uh, my, my worldview. And I was thinking what it is gonna be that's going to shape your lives and your views and your view of the world. And I'm not quite sure. I'm absolutely sure about two things. One is that you will be shaped by the exponential developments which we didn't have to face. One of them being technology that's absolutely the case. And, and one thing that unfortunately looks like more and more will be the case is, is uh, the assumptions that we all live by and the believe in, in democracy and liberal, plural, international, or pluralistic li uh, international order is something that whether you were in the East or the West, we believed in. We from behind the Iron Curtain and the West by osmosis. And uh, over the last few years, things are being challenged. And uh, truth is no longer the truth and, and universal values don't seem to have the universal appeal. So really the, the world is, is, is having a little bit darker clouds than, than a few years ago. And I think what we want to do in the course and we promised the students that we are not gonna have answers. What we can do is, is raise the questions, try to uh, show the different points of view, maybe show some good examples, maybe talk about uh, uh, good case studies, bad case studies, and really just critically assess and think about, uh, think about the issues. I think there probably will be some basics, some truth, that we will, we will bring, but uh, the one thing that uh, we have to promise you that we are not gonna have the answers, but we will together uh, explore the questions around and, 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 and try to analyze it um, uh, together. So what are the new realities? I actually took what I want to read to you and uh, probably many of you will recognize uh, where it comes from. What we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. So apart from the professors, from the students, who recognizes this quote? Very good. So I'm sure that you all have the answer. This is a Francis Fukuyama famous end of history essay, uh, 1989, that fo was followed by, by a book. And that some years later, uh, he already uh, sort of readjusted, et cetera. But 
now looking on over two decades, uh, it's amazing how with every passing week and every new, you know, Colbert, not report, but uh, Tonight Show or whatever, late night show that, that we all watch and love, um, it looks more and more naive in a sense. But it's not really na naivete that, that's uh, in there. It's, it's really the, the, the essence of how hard it is to assess the time we live in. And it's getting harder and harder because, because of the exponential development that, that we see around us, something that evolutionary our minds are, our brains are not equipped to deal with because everything around us is linear. It's one, two, three, seven, eight, nine. And evolutionary, we, we don't really work in, uh, in, uh, in exponential curve. That's why it always surprises us. And, and therefore it's really, uh, not easy to assess the life we live in, but uh, let us look at what happened. Uh, some of the some of the uh, things that happened since 1989. That was the year when the Berlin Wall fell, or the the Velvet Revolution happened, etc. Two years later, uh, the Soviet Union fell apart. Anytime I speak, mention the word Soviet Union or communism, it must sound to you as if when my grandmother and grandfather were talking about the Second World War. I mean, you probably have as much uh, realistic appreciation for that as, as, as we, we had to the, to the uh, uh, war times. Um, but apart from these big developments, what we are observing now is not only that we have on the one hand no borders in Europe so far, but we also have gaping inequality in the world, which is something that's shaping today's uh, uh, discourse, which is affecting politics. As Oxfam famously said in the World Economic Forum last year that there are eight people in the world that have the same amount of wealth at 50% of the lower 50% of the population, which is quite an astounding statistics. We have in some parts of the world gotten rid of uh, censorship and, and ban on photocopy machines. But on the other hand, we have information overload. And when you have so much information, it's very hard to sort through it. Uh, on the one hand, we brought democracy to many, many corners of the world, certainly to the part that EU exceeded, uh, that exceeded to the EU. But on the other hand, we are watching ascent of populist politicians. And not only in among neighbors on, or only in developing countries, but inside the EU, in the United States, we have uh, the likes of Marie Le Pen or Gerd Wilders or the True Finns. We have Brexit, that was a classic <coughs> example of populist uh, <coughs> driven um, reaction. We have uh, the ascent of, of uh, Donald Trump in the, in the US and uh, since the Americans are studying in Europe, I assume that probably a safe assumption that that uh, are watching the, the news from home uh, with some concern uh, as well. We have new models being offered, competing with democracies of new authoritative leaders, whether it's Putin, whether it's Erdogan in Turkey or Maduro in Venezuela. And the appeal that they have to the likes of President Vucic in Serbia and the emulation that that uh, some of the leaders where we would hope would stick to the democratic path are uh, these, these autocratic uh, leaders have. The Heritage Foundation has now commented three or four years in a row that the trend of democracy spreading outside of uh, the traditional countries 
has actually reversed, and there has been a decreasing uh, number of democrat countries that can be called truly democratic. So the appeal of the populists and the appeal of the autocratic leaders is seems to be uh, seems to be on a on a on an as, on an ascent. So I think the question, you know, what will shape your lives and your thinking is is in order because I think the the need to preserve uh, what what we have had is is going to be probably a challenge for for uh, your generation. Now, how is it affecting? What is the uh, offer of the EU side? How is it affecting the neighborhood and enlargement uh, countries? Well, first of all, these developments are very much affecting the discourse, the political discourse uh, inside the European Union. And we are right now entering a phase, we have entered into a phase after the serial crises that, that the EU was facing since 2008 that started with the uh, euro crisis, then financial crisis, then economic crisis, then migration uh, wave came, came in. And in the process, there was a flurry of, of, of legislating and trying to keep the the, in, the single market and the intermarket in order and try to keep the uh, EU institutional makeup sort of working. And now we have essentially a process of two interlocking, three, sorry, interlocking uh, aspects that are very present and affect the discourse, the political discourse and the atmosphere in the EU. One is a reflection on what is going to be the institutional setup of the EU going forward. Because the one thing that the crises have shown is that the status quo is not, not doable long term. So there is very much a reflection. You might have heard about five scenarios that were put together, presented by President Juncker, etc., or broader other reflections, but there is very much very much uh, a look at the, at the institutional functioning of the EU, what is going to happen to the Eurozone, which is a subset of the country. So there is a lot of internal reflection, very much a belly button moment where the EU says, okay, everything has to wait because this is what we need to uh, sort out. That's one aspect. Second aspect is that in that process, the EU has, the UK has voted to leave the Union. And it has first an existential impact on the EU, right? Is it one off case? Is it gonna be replicated? For now, leaders feel this is a one off. The UK has been the oddball anyway. There were exceptions and carve outs and and rebates, et cetera, affecting uh, sort of the UK's uneasy uh, coexistence with the EU. So good riddance will be okay, that's one view. The other view is much more nuanced, thinking, well, the UK is a big player. We, are, we have ambitions, whether it's in terms of security, whether it's in terms of development <laughs> policy, projecting EU values uh, um, in the developing world, I mean, in across the areas, the UK is a big player and it's in our huge interest to, to, to keep the relationship as robust as possible. So these things are affecting each other. The jury is still out. We'll see how it's going to, to end. Uh, but we are also going to through uh, a look at the new uh, multi-annual financial perspective. This mouthful means EU plans its resources seven years uh, of, of, through seven year periods. UK is a big net contributor to the EU budget. So the financial side is also affecting all of this uh, other policies. So that's the second big issue. And the third big issue is the migration crisis, which for now there is a tiny bit of respite, but let's not kid ourselves, uh, migratory uh, migratory moves are on a worldwide, you know, 
ascending trajectory uh, with the cost of travel uh, decreasing, uh, with, uh, with information uh, flowing freely. Migration happens and will happen and will increase. It's a matter how you manage it. And we so far haven't, uh, haven't figured out the, the, the silver bullet. So you have these three big trends, these three big debates inside the EU and they have huge impact on the state building, institution building, ambitious, ambish, um, political ambitions, integration hopes of countries uh, around, the, around the EU. I'm somebody who, has, uh, who is a true believer in the transformational power of the European Union. I lived through it and also see it now from the different perspective. Who is here from uh, new member states? The 2004 and 2007 enlargements. Raise your hands. Okay, so we have, uh, we have uh, uh, several, of, uh, several of us here. I mean, the one thing that uh, we, our countries have gone through and have lived through is the, the pull of the EU, which came with huge pressure on really fundamental transformational reforms and changes in our countries. But the framework for it was the prospect for EU integration. That was the goal. And as we all know, what gets measured gets done. Having goals actually helps achieving them having realistic goals. And there was, a, there was a credible prospect of enlargement, and that was the motivating factor behind really fundamental uh, transformation of our societies and of our economies, to a point that the, the whole eastern flank of the EU is economically, in terms of the structure of the economies, the competitiveness uh, factors, etc much closer to the performant Northwest than the lagging, economically lagging southern tier of the EU. So it's, a, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, there's been leapfrogging under that, under that promise of, uh, of uh, enlargement. So the transformational power is there, but it's directly correlated. It's correlated to the normative, to the normative power. It's correlated to the credible promise of enlargement. Because the less you have that credible perspective, the harder it is to push for the, for the reforms internally. Because actually, technically, the reforms are, you know, everybody knows what one needs to do. It's how you politically, how you politically orchestrate the consensus uh, around them. And, uh, the Western Balkans, in fact, are a good example. Because when it was clear that there is no appetite for enlargement, to a point that in 2014, the current commission, through the, through the words of uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the president, said that during his mandate, there is not gonna be any enlargement. That actually became, a, a, it was a little shocker, uh, to the countries and, and it's been much harder to push for, for the kind of reforms, whether it's along the rule of law, fight against organized crime, fight against corruption, or even uh, fundamental economic uh, reforms internally. So um, now that enlargement is back on the agenda, uh, and that uh, in the State of the Union uh, address in September, it was announced that, that yes, there are front runners, but the whole Balkans is, is back in the enlargement uh, uh, scope. We are seeing already acceleration in some of the, in some of the uh, reforms that were stalled until, uh, until now. Uh, on the 6th of February, we will be, we will be uh, publishing a Western Balkan strategy, enlargement strategy, where the uh, possibility of enlargement will be, will be announced, but at the same time, 
there's going to be a long list of homework that needs to, uh, needs to happen uh, for that. So if it's done well, and if it's done with insight and understanding of the political economy and the institutional economy of, of uh, transition, the transformational power can actually uh, bring good results. And I, I, I very much hope that the Western Balkans will be a testimony to that, just like the enlargement of 2004 and 2007 has been a testimony to it as well. Now, let's not say that everything's been done perfectly, even in the countries that, that I'm talking about. And the backsliding issue is something that, uh, that is very topical as well. You may have been reading in the, in the press about the concerns about Poland, Hungary, but also some more established uh, 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 democracies on issues of institutions and weakness of institutions, especially judiciary, etc., which is the, the Achilles heel of, uh, of a lot of the, uh, of a lot of the, the, the countries. But uh, as I said, hopefully the prospect of enlargement will be sufficient uh, uh, push for, for continued transformation. And uh, as I said, this is my, uh, well, it's my metier, but also my conviction that international actors can positively influence uh, processes and, and institutions in the, in the countries. But, uh, but that influence gets smaller if the countries that, for example, have integration ambitions with the EU don't have that perspective. And this is what brings me to, to the um, Eastern Partnership countries. Let me remind us that the three countries here, which is Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, and Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, in the, in the Caucasus. And um, in 2014, uh, there was, when was the, the Vilnius summit? It was four years ago, right? So um, in 2013, right? So in 2013, there was a very dramatic summit in Vilnius, in the capital of Lithuania, uh, where, where countries were expected to sign something called association agreements and initial something called, and don't ask me who comes up with these names and acronyms, DCFTA, Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Area. Mouthful. Very uh, uh, profound and far-reaching and deep uh, uh, free trade agreement with the EU once implemented the results of which would bring the countries uh, to approximately even even further than than the free trade area with Norway Norway and Liechtenstein that that they enjoy with the with the, with the EU so a very profound agreement um, in the lead up to the summit just to mention two things that happened the Armenian president was called to Moscow uh, where it was explained to him that they are not going to be signing the association agreement with the EU, and Armenia, being in a very unfavorable, uh, being in a very very unfavorable uh, geographic position, stuck, uh, stu uh, sorry, uh, stuck between Turkey with its historical grievances, Azerbaijan, with whom there is a. Uh, there is a conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, and, and, uh, and Iran, and the only sort of favorable neighbor being Georgia, um, acceded to the pressure from the Kremlin and did not sign the agreement. And what happened in Ukraine, uh, the then President Yanukovych said he's not going to sign the agreement as well after various discussions with, with its big neighbor as well. And the Maidan revolution ensued, the revolution of dignity. So you in fact had the largest country of the six uh, having a c citizen and CSO led 
uh, protest against the regime that that uh, pushed Yanukovych out, new regime came in. And so this was the choices, essentially, of that should be sovereign choices of the countries have become part of this big geopolitical game that is far from being over. The pressure on the smaller ones is still exercised with uh, quite a lot of uh, influence. The, the propaganda and hybrid war is present in, in, in all of them. It's present in the EU but as well, but, uh, but when we talk about the neighborhood in all of them, and in the case of Ukraine, there is actually a war going on where, where people are dying. And in fact, two days ago, there's been a, an, an official admission by Ukraine uh, and statement that there is a war with Russia and no longer pretending that, uh, that it's a little green men of unaffiliated separatist uh, nature. So you suddenly have uh, the choices of integration with the EU become part of a big, big geopolitical chess, which is complicating the situation very much. Because what this means is in the EU, that has the three big issues dealing with its internal institutional uh, maturing, uh, the Brexit related existential drama and financial impact and migration, which is, uh, which is of existential nature in a, of, a, of a different kind, suddenly is not only are we giving a prospect to, to our neighbors, but do we really want to do that if it's going to piss off the guy in Kremlin and the entourage around, right? And this is, uh, while this can be an obvious choice for some, it is, a very different obvious choice for others. And, and the EU being of uh, 28 with wildly different views on this subject uh, means that currently there is no, not only no appetite for enlargement, but really no willingness to even signal to the countries that yet beyond what we already have, which is the three associate uh, countries having signed the association agreement and the free trade uh, work towards the free trade uh, area, a willingness to even signal that that process will continue even in the medium run. So this is the current, this is the, the, the current look at, uh, at, the, at the situation. And what does it do? What does it do to the countries? Right? We call them neighborhood, but that's our label towards them. When you look from being from the perspective of being Ukrainian, uh, both of my co-professors or somebody even in the audience, um, or if you are a, a Georgian, that is the best pupil in class that has done tremendous amount of, uh, of reforms, even the most difficult one for its neighbors, decreasing uh, corruption. Georgia has actually done this as a case study, in, in a good case study in this respect, eager to be closely integrated, feels it's getting a cold shoulder. And what does it do to the, to the institutions to the processes to the institution building to to the to the to both democracy as well as further reforms in the country it is something that uh, we will discuss in the course from very different perspectives we will have a session on the rule of law judiciary we will have a session on corruption on uh, civil society we may even talk about security aspects we will talk about uh, economic reforms uh, and, and the political economy of, of institutional changes to really, to really see how the um, international influence can work both to the, to the benefit and how sometimes one needs to be more careful because it can have uh, a very perverse impact. I'm going to use uh, 
an example from Ukraine, a very topical, very concrete Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian uh, 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 case. Let me just ask you, reforms in Ukraine, glass half full or glass half empty? Who, who goes for glass half full? Professors included. <laughs> Six brave hands, seven brave hands. And glass half empty? Oh, clearly a majority. Uh, very, you know, very representative to uh, what uh, what uh, I've been uh, uh, facing on uh, on uh, on a daily basis because Ukraine is a country which occupies a, a lot of my time. We have something called a support group for Ukraine in the in Vigineer, and and I work, uh, I sort of supervise their work and work directly with them and travel there and etc. Uh, it's very interesting how a Russian narrative about Ukraine helps shaping public opinion about Ukraine outside of its borders, and the, the you know thousand times repeated lie becomes the truth is 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 a case in point here, and second how how much reform overdrive and the, and the, I would say, excessive pressure that the international community put on the table and overloaded the agenda of the Ukrainians keeps, you know, can create a situation where it looks like half empty, but when you analyze what has been done, uh, it's something that, you know, in Western democracies, a tenth of it would bring down a government. Very, two small examples. Over two, the last two years, the, uh, you, three years ago, Ukraine was on the verge of a uh, macroeconomic meltdown. We were already preparing scenarios. What if, if there needs to be a big bailout? It's not Greece, it's much bigger economy, you know. What is you know between the IMF and the World Bank and e EU and the US, how a package could look like? None of that happened. They stabilized the economy, being in war, and brought down the deficit by 80 percent, five times reduction in the budget deficit. Now think of Belgium or France or Germany or Slovakia or Poland. how much political <laughs> pressure, interest, vested interests, uh, uh, discussion, uh, fallen governments, uh, etc., are involved in bringing the deficit down from by 30%, by 10%, by 5%. But to bring it down fivefold, that is quite an, that is such a shocking figure that it's not even being discussed. And the second example is that in the last two years, Ukraine brought down public expenditure as percentage of GDP by 13%. When President Macron will try to bring down public dis expenditure as, pra as, as percentage of France's uh, GDP by 3%, everybody's gonna be en grève uh, in Paris and in every other city or in, a, in any other countries. 13% is such a gaping drop in, in, uh, in uh, public expenditure that, again, it's, it's even hard to follow. It's so big. And it happened by tough decisions and squeezing the population on the one hand, and on the other hand by, by eliminating corruption in key sectors of the economy, banking, gas, public procurement and, uh, and uh, currency, currency exchange. We'll talk about it more. We'll talk about the mechanics. And we'll also talk about how in institutionally weak environment, it's much safer to eliminate the space for corruption to occur rather than try to punish corruption once it occurs 
because you need strong institutions to be able to investigate, prosecute, and 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 put put people in jails. So these are some of the some of the choices, some of the examples, and we'll also talk about the role that the international community played in in putting the uh, putting all the things on the agenda and will circulate some articles that, that question how, how, um, uh, how wise uh, this was and whether, whether it's not going to be counterproductive from a, from a, a long-term perspective. But uh, hopefully by the end of the course, there'll be more hands up on half full rather than half empty, half empty uh, uh, reforms. Um, let me conclude. Uh, and then open up the uh, debate just saying that it is, it is a tall order for the EU to be trying to get its house in order and at the same time try to, try to have and, and facilitate and support a belt of stability and prosperity around its borders. It's like uh, Svetlana used a fantastic example. It's like if you have a troubled adult with his or her own problems, and at the same time, you still need to to be dealing uh, and helping the kids sort out through their problems. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed uh, as, as as parents as well. Max uh, being the exception, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, uh, I. All I can say that uh, I have bad news for you, which is the world is complex and a lot more than, than when we were setting out on our professional careers. But the good news is that we hopefully have, will have an interesting course where we will discuss all of this and, and, and hopefully equip you with some interesting answers and not answers, sorry, questions uh, and approaches to this. So thank you very, very much.